in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about the availability heuristic which is somewhat similar to the confirmation bias that a lot of people are familiar with as you know as at least the reason that everybody thinks they can dismiss what anyone else says because you know those people suffer from confirmation bias but I don't uh, but the availability heuristic it as I said is is similar in that you know it's sort of I guess reducing the denominator in our probability and so uh, so I have this set up here and so we can think of a as the times when something happens and then this tilde a is the times when something doesn't happen uh, and so the rational thing to do would be to take all the instances of an event uh, so that an event the event actually occurs and divide uh, I misspelled that it should be divide by the number of possible occasions on which the event could have occurred. And so the possible occasions on which it could have occurred are the times that it did occur plus the times it did not occur. And so the availability heuristic is uh, in it's similar to confirmation bias in the sense that we are sort of uh, underestimating this this uh, not a so the times when something did not occur so where a are the instances that e, the event occurs until the a the instances where it does not occur so instead people judge the probability of events by the ease with with which instances come to mind and so this is kind of the the thing with availability heuristic that sort of distinguishes it from confirmation bias it's sort of like the the uh, sampling some sort of sampling bias by the you know little statistician in our heads uh, and so the ease with which something comes to mind so the availability of instances or anecdotes in our mental search engine uh, and so the ease with which things come to mind can be determined by several things so uh, so exposure is certainly one and so I put here uh, you know like your neighborhood so say you grew up somewhere where you know people believed a certain way and so you kind of came to the conclusion that this is you know pretty much broadly how most people think uh, and then sort of echo chambers which is kind of uh, our way of actually sort of doing that to ourselves where we we choose to interact with people in communities that sort of already believe what we believe and so you know you you often hear about like the liberal bias in media uh, that these people live in a bubble or that you know politicians or rich people live in this bubble where you know they don't know like how you know normal people live and so they live in this place in this neighborhood or in this echo chamber where they are sort of exposed to something that is not common uh, more often and so they end up this ends up being easier to come to their mind uh, and then of course there is recency and so you know something that happened recently is going to seem uh, it's going to feel like it's probably more common than what it actually is just because you know what happened recently then the other two so vividness and emotional poignancy so you know if something happens that's you know very big you know say like kind of a 9-11 thing or you know a COVID-19 thing or you know the Russia war on Ukraine kind of thing these things are very vivid and they sort of invoke a lot of emotions in us and so those kind of things can make those easier to come up with it's it's easier to come up with instances of those in our minds and so it can seem maybe like those sorts of things are much more common than they are uh, and so this can cause us to drastically underestimate sort of the uh, times when something doesn't happen you know it's it's always difficult to count the number of times something doesn't happen compared to the times that something does happen uh, and so I you know I put this here that maybe it would be something like this so we're downplaying our not a so you know maybe multiplying it by 
you know, 0 0.25 or something smaller to actually reduce it, uh, which would make us assign greater probability to A because now our denominator here is becoming smaller, which makes uh, this whole thing larger. And so therefore we have our probability of A being uh, estimated as higher. And so the media tends to uh, supply us with a steady stream of of these hits and not the misses. So, uh, so you know, the media supplies us with a steady supply of when things do happen, not when they don't happen. So this can lead people to believe that some things are much more common than they actually are. Uh, so the uh, Steven Pinker uses crime as an example. So crime makes the news, you know, sort of if it bleeds, it leads. And so people have many instances of crime happening available to their mental search engine where instances where crime is not happening go unreported. And so they don't end up in sort of our denominator there. And so we get this false impression that the probability that we will experience some kind of crime is uh, going to be much higher. And so Steven Pinker also uses the example of, uh, of plane crashes. And so on average, over the entire world, around 250 people die each year from plane crashes. Uh, and so uh, we'll say that, uh, so I think I might have mixed up the A and C here, but we'll say that C here is the number of uh, plane crashes, and then obviously tilde C is the number of not plane crashes. Uh, and then approximately 15 million people die each year from car accidents. And so we'll say that uh, that A is the amount of automobile accidents, and tilde A is the amount of, I guess, people who drive and don't get into car accidents. Uh, yet a plane crash is much more likely to get a lot of news coverage. Uh, whereas you will likely not hear anything about the vast majority of fatalities caused by traffic accidents, giving people the false impression that planes are more dangerous than cars. And, you know, this can kind of go to sort of that, uh, that emotional poignancy or viv vividness as well in that, you know, plane crashes often, you know, they're these kind of big things, and so they they look a lot more sort of vivid to us than you know car accidents, and so you know that can kind of also contribute to this sort of availability heuristic of plane crashes. Uh, and so when I read this in Steven Pinker's book, I thought I wonder if there is a base rate fallacy going on here because you know it seems like there'd be a lot more people driving. And so therefore, you know, it would obviously be the case that more people would die in car accidents. So I did a little back of the envelope calculations here just to try and see. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the calculations here. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is I did the calculations using numbers for uh, just the United States. I couldn't really find any for the world. Uh, but the, the take home message here is that uh, we're on the order of 10 to the 12 uh, people miles per year in both, uh, in both cars, which is what I was looking at up here and in airplanes. And so the sort of people miles per year is the same with both cars and uh, airplanes. And so you would expect that to be sort of your base rates for how many sort of accidents happen uh, in both cars and airplanes. And so uh, these are my sources right here. Uh, and so also numbers were all rounded for simplicity. And uh, so kind of another simplifying assumption. So if we want worldwide numbers, we could assume that the numbers increase by an order of magnitude, given that the world population is an order of magnitude greater than the U.S. population. So the U.S. population is on the order of, of the 100 million order of magnitude, where the a world population is on the order of a billion people. 
uh, or in, in that order of magnitude. Uh, but so the idea here being that these base rates are pretty much the same for driving and flying. And so there does not seem to be a base rate fallacy going on here. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that was, you know, that's pretty much, you know, everything is an introduction to this uh, availability heuristic. And so I guess kind of the take home message is when you're trying to, you know, come up with with the probability that something could happen, keep these uh, these four things in mind. Uh, so, you know, what is my echo chamber? You know, am I gaining my information from my from you know my chosen echo chambers from from my chosen communities? Am I sort of trying to you know make judgments, probability judgments, based on sort of a uh, a false sort of base rate here where I'm basing it on, you know, just the people and ideas that I'm exposed to. So the other thing to keep in mind is how recent something is. You know, if it's recent, uh, that will probably actually contribute to its vividness and its emotional poignancy. And so that's the, uh, those are the other things to keep in mind when you're trying to make a judgment is, you know, am, am I sort of increasing my my judgment of the probability of something because it's very vivid or invokes a lot of sort of emotions in me and therefore makes it sort of loom larger in my mind. Uh, and so, yeah, it, when it comes to sort of the uh, the conceit of this whole video series, think how to think rationally. Uh, if you want to think rationally, then keep this availability heuristic in mind. And, you know, I, I can sit here and tell you till I'm blue in the face to do that, but both you and I are going to succumb to this availability heuristic. This, uh, you know, and this is why my sort of pessimism uh, clashes with Steven Pinker's optimism is because uh, I think this availability heuristic is going to be pretty much inevitable, uh, you know, for me, for you, for everybody you run into. It's hard to escape this availability heuristic. Uh, even when you know you're doing it, it's hard to not fall victim to it. And so, you know, that's sort of an irrationality that everybody is going to just have to deal with. And, you know, at least on reflection, you know, at least try to keep in mind that you will fall victim to this availability heuristic. And so, you know, even if in, you know, sort of your snap judgments in the moment, you do succumb to the availability heuristic, at least every once in a while try to reflect on your thoughts and think, am I succumbing to this availability heuristic? Uh, and so one thing I should point out too is that uh, that Steven Pinker does does point out that I think is correct is that in a lot of cases the availability heuristic is you know a, pr a pretty decent uh, indicator of something and so he uses the example of you know if we ask somebody what is the most common type of bird they're probably going to say you know either sparrows or pigeons and they're going to be correct because you know they are exposed to a lot of sparrows and pigeons more than you know most other types of birds and so that those things are available to their mind and so you know that kind of goes to this number one here this exposure and so there are instances obviously where this uh, is not just leading us astray but uh, I think especially with these bottom three here uh, it can lead us astray and if we uh, think of exposure as sort of our echo chambers and things like that, then that can also lead us astray. And so it's important to kind of reflect on that and think about, you know, whether our availability heuristic is sort of leading us astray or not. But anyway, I'm kind of starting to ramble. I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next video.